Okay. Uh, as Ralph was talking, I thought I would share a uh, Gran Turismo story of my own. Um, I had the privilege of leading uh, two teams to the Nürburgring. I call them expeditions because especially on our first trip to the Nürburgring, it really felt like we were going to go climb Mount Everest or something. Um, nobody on the team had ever uh, been to the track before, and this was the biggest, most daunting track in the world, and we had this Viper ACR that we thought uh, could do a very good time there. Um, so I asked all of the team who was traveling with me to uh, get out their PlayStations and, and learn the track, learn all the turns, understand uh, what the track was all about. Um, of course, we knew we needed a driver that knew the track. The driver, Tom Cornell, who, who drove uh, for us on our first trip, um, had a lot of experience at the Nürburgring, um, but he had never driven our car before. So that was a little bit of a disadvantage for us. And um, after we were there, we only had a four hour window um, and there were, there were uh, some wet sections in the track in the beginning, but we managed to get the uh, production car lap record. Um, but when we left, uh, we knew there was more time on the table. Um, and the record stood for, for three years, and it was broken, I think, three times that summer before we went back. Um, and this time, the second time we went back, uh, we also brushed up on our Gran Turismo, we brushed up on driving around the Nürburgring. Um, but we decided to bring uh, not only the Viper ACR, but also the ACRX, which is uh, a race-only version, if you remember a few years ago. And we decided to invite one of our factory drivers, Kuno Whitmer, who was very familiar with the ACRX but had never driven on the Nürburgring uh, before. So Kuno's homework was to play Gran Turismo over and over and over again and learn the track. Um, and with the number of turns and the amount that you have to learn on that track, uh, what he did was miraculous because he turned a lap time of seven minute, three seconds on that, t that track, just barely over uh, seven minutes, and he had never been to the track before. It was all because Gran Turismo is more of a simulator uh, than a video game. So technical, um, what is the formula of speed? Um, this was a question when Mark approached me that it was the first thing that went in my mind. We, we shouldn't go light on this. We should go all the way. What, what's the limit? What is the limit of performance? And with figuring out speed, there's a lot of math, a lot of equations, uh, a lot of grimble, um, but we're not going to go over all of this today. Uh, we're just going to talk about the highlights. Uh, but one of the interesting things is we developed the car. We, uh, we wanted an extreme level of performance, but we were concerned that it was going to be really, really difficult to drive, especially for a novice uh, at at Gran Turismo. So that's where the three versions of the car were born. We actually uh, developed the Tomahawk X as the lead vehicle. And then we said, well, we need at least another version to kind of be as a training ground to, for the player to sort of warm up to all this performance. And then that, the, the training car was still pretty quick around the track and, and very, we thought would be very difficult to drive. And then the third car was born. and they sort of took on the three letters of SRT. They sort of embodied the three, the three meanings of SRT. We had a street version, we had a racing version, and we had an, a technology version. And that's the S, the GTSR, and the Tomahawk X. So these main things we want to focus on are uh, these five things. Um, aerodynamic, aerodynamic grip, horsepower, weight, center of gravity, mechanical grip. These are the five, what you would say in the math equation that would describe a lap, these would be the first order part of the equations with a lot of other things that make a car go fast, but those would be second order, third order, fourth order. The first order things are right there on that screen and we wanted to attack those again to the most extreme level uh, with the Tomahawk. So first aerodynamic, um, you've seen on the video the very animated panels on the Tomahawk X. Um, there are nine of them all together. Um, one, one over each uh, wheel fender. There's a, a two element uh, rear wing. Uh, rear flaps that are not air brakes. They, they can be deployed as air brakes, but they're 
also uh, yaw control. They're actually like rudders, the two panels uh, at the rear. And the four panels over each of the, the four tires, those also can produce yaw force, which is something unique, I think, on the Tomahawk X, where we're not just creating a massive amount of downforce, we're actually bending the air to steer the car uh, around the racetrack. And then, of course, on the video, the braking mode, where all these panels deploy to create the biggest possible frontal surface area, doubling the, the front surface area almost like a uh, parachute, like a composite parachute. And when you play the game, and you're going at an extreme uh, speed, and you'll see this out there, and if you deploy, if you hit the brakes really, really hard, you'll actually hear a pop, and you'll hear like a, the sonic effect um, that the, the polyphony team actually put into the game with the massive amount of turbulence that it causes when these things deploy. So there's uh, also a lot of elements that we, we designed underneath the car because we knew to make it uh, a legitimate concept, we need to answer the question of the underbody aerodynamics. And the ninth panel is the active uh, front splitter in the front. Uh, but there's also a beautiful um, set of uh, rear strakes and diffusers that five of which that line up with the five exhaust tips and if you look at the exhaust system they there's uh, independent runners that are two into one that line up with these exhaust tips that you can see here in this view so of course horsepower is important to us we're SRT right the makers of Hellcats and Vipers we we weren't going to be bashful about making this a powerful car and as Mark mentioned, the, the S, the sort of entry-level vehicle, um, has a 700-plus horsepower version of a V10 naturally aspirated uh, motor. Um, we liked the idea of the V10 because it's a heritage with the Viper, but we wanted to take it to the next level. And at first, we uh, designed a flat 10, a horizontally opposed or 180-degree uh, V10. Um, but the packaging wasn't optimal for getting the center of gravity low. And also, uh, we determined that 144 degree angle was actually a more balanced um, firing order for the engine. So we tipped up the cylinder bank just a little bit so it's nearly flat uh, to get the optimum uh, engine package for the Tomahawk. And the displacement, we uh, sort of made homage to the Hemi engines of Lore, and it's just under seven liters or 426 uh, cubic inches. It's not, a, it's not a Hemi head, no, it's, it's, a, it's an advanced um, motor which is closer to a, uh, a Formula One motor in construction. It has pneumatic valves because of the high RPM. The, the Tomahawk X revs to 14,000 RPM and uh, pneumatic valves are required um, for uh, valve float. So it's actually a completely different motor from the Viper. Um, our second uh, energy or power generation for the Tomahawk comes in the form of a pneumatic system. And this was born out of looking at the, our aerodynamic uh, proposal with all these panels actuating and they had to actuate really, really quickly with under a tremendous amount of aero load. They needed to have a lot of power behind them. And when we thought about what might be a good motivation for these. Obviously, electric motors is something you could do. You could do hydraulics. Um, but the theme of this car is kind of, kind of along the lines of air supremacy, right? So we thought, what better than to use compressed air or a pneumatic system uh, to be our second energy source for the Tomahawk? So this provides us with a front drive, which um, this pneumatic energy can be either released or uh, regenerated from the front wheels. And it also can be taken up by the, rear, the uh, power unit on the back of the engine. When the engine isn't being used to accelerate the car, that power can be used to uh, compress air into the pneumatic storage tanks. But weight obviously was a priority for us. So we didn't want to just have a couple of big uh, air tanks hanging on, in the car chassis. So we made them part of the car chassis. Uh, the filament wound composite uh, multi-material pneumatic energy tanks are actually integrated into the backbone of the Tomahawk. So weight. Um, 
although you can't visualize this, we put some thought into what the tomahawk might be made out of. And the whole idea of this was to not look a couple years down the road, but 20 years down the road, what materials are emerging now that might be available for an auto designer at the extreme level 20 years from now. And science has been recently developing some extremely lightweight um, new materials such as graphene and micro lattice structures that have a lot of promise, but they're not currently developed to a form that can be used in a vehicle like this. So of course there's carbon fiber, of course there's titanium in this car, but the way we've imagined the Tomahawk is also using these burgeoning new uh, high-tech materials. Center of gravity. Um, you've probably noticed already that the vehicle is very, very low. Um, the driver sits really, really low. The engine is low, as I mentioned. Um, this was an early concept sketch by uh, one of the designers you'll see out there um, that shows kind of the whole package, all the heavy bits, and how we keep those things, all those components, including the driver himself, as low as possible uh, in the car. And if you look at the rear view, um, you can clearly see that all of the mechanical uh, parts and systems are below the center line of the wheel. So this puts the center of gravity actually below the center, uh, center line of wheel and um, helps generate these really, really fast cornering speeds. Mechanical grip. Um, last but not least are the tires and how they interface with the car because Everyone who knows about um, sports cars and race cars knows that the interface of the tire to the tarmac is, is the most important interface in the whole system. So we have extremely wide tires, over 300 millimeter in front and over 400 millimeter in the rear. And we would imagine these tires being constructed again out of uh, compounds that aren't currently developed today, they're not con currently available today, um, but would be possible in the future. And the loads that this car comes under, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of cars like to talk about, a lot of race cars, Formula One and, and high aerodynamic cars, talk about the ability of this car to be driven upside down. It makes so much downforce. The Tomahawk X uh, generates six times the vehicle's mass um, in aerodynamic downforce at its highest level. So we didn't stop with wide tires. Um, we looked at the suspension system and said, what, what could this pneumatic system do to help the suspension be optimized? And we imagined for the Tomahawk active camber control. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar that camber is important to a racer. And normally, it's negative camber, leaning the top of the tire inward so that when you're in a turn, that the tire is contacting the pavement in the optimal way. And you've probably seen with oval track racing like NASCAR, where they, they actually have a bias on both wheels to lean both wheels into the turn because they're always making left turns. Well, the active camber control in the Tomahawk allows the vehicle to quickly adjust the camber for both left and right turns with this high power pneumatic system to constantly optimize the suspension for the given track environment. So what would it feel like to drive a Tomahawk? Ralph talked a little bit about this. When you play the game and you get really good at it, it is a workout. Your heart rate rises. Uh, it's very exciting. Every, your complete focus, in order to put a good lap time, you must be completely focused on what you're doing. Um, and there's, a, there's an adrenaline that comes with that. But in the real world, um, it would do something like this to you. <laughs> The G-forces are real, uh, or would be real, for this concept, and they would exceed, at the peak, uh, 10G uh, in the lateral turn. So obviously 10G is not a, a, a sort of a condition that a human body likes to be in, so we've also imagined a G-suit um, that's required for both the Tomahawk GTSR and the Tomahawk X because of their massive lateral loading. And unlike a fighter pilot G-suit, which mainly concentrates on the legs and the lower body to keep the blood from flowing to the legs, the Tomahawk G-suit has elements you can see in the back that are helping keep the rib cage, the organs, all the vitals kind of uh, balanced properly in these, in these crazy turns, this, this crazy level of, of uh, performance that the car is able to generate. So with that, um, I guess I'll invite those who uh, have spoken to come up and answer any questions.